They're living in a time where externally, life is rich, bountiful, and yet spiritually, they are what? Empty. We're gonna spend some, the remainder of the spring, all the way up till summer, um, diving into the book of Hosea. Um, it's the first book of the Minor Prophets, um, so it's gonna be a doozy, it's, it's gonna be so good. Uh, but actually, James Montgomery Boyce calls this the second greatest story ever told. The first being, of course, the gospel of Jesus' death and resurrection, but this is the second greatest story ever told. Uh, it's the story that actually explores the relationship, the, um, it explores the emotional toil that causes the first greatest story to even take place. That what took place for, from God and his love for his people, what, what's going on with him that causes such an amazing story to be told. It gives us insight behind the behavior that God exerts by sending Jesus uh, to the cross. Um, and one of one of the ways the Bible paints our relationship with God is what? It's between a husband and a bride. This is especially true for the Old Testament, um, but it's also, we see that with Jesus and the church. Jesus the husband, we the bride, okay? Um, and this imagery in Hosea, it plays heavily into the issues of commitment and relational intimacy with God. Hosea kind of shows that our relationship with God would make excellent reality television, <laughs> right? And of course, so much of the drama comes from the bride, doesn't it, <laughs> right? It's always, uh, you know, and you're rooting for the, the, the man in the relationship. You're like, oh man, just leave her. She's not worth it, you know, that kind of thing. She doesn't deserve you. Um, that is pretty much the story of Hosea. Um, Hosea does not actually, I'm going to pre-warn you on this, it does not offer much hope. I'm really sorry. We're going to spend all spring, it's going to be raining, we're going to be sad the whole time. Um, it does testify to the fact that we do have hope and how great our hope is. It shows us the depths of our real situation. And then when we think about hope, man, we have so much more respect for it now, don't we? We treasure it a whole lot more when we realize the depths of where we're at really with God, where we would be if we didn't have this grace. So we're gonna be spending some time examining judgment. Um, and although unpleasant, it's gonna, I think it's gonna help guide our church body um, to take a serious issue on what the gospel is addressing. Um, but it also prepares us to receive and exercise grace. I think I want us by the end of this to be a much more grace-filled church that not only we do that amongst ourselves, but the world around us is experiencing this grace. And it's like, what is this? I want more of it, right? Uh, grace, uh, though, is not the immediate question you probably have about this series title, is it? Uh, you're probably like, oh, yeah, I've seen that word before, but what on earth is raisin cakes, right? What is that? Well, the title comes from our guiding verse for our study in Hosea. And um, we mentioned this in the email, but if you'd like to follow along in a way, take lots of notes, um, we put in the, in the emails, uh, this is like a book that you can have, that's a study book, but it's great. You can basically write away everything. But we're gonna have one verse out of chapter three that's gonna be kind of our guiding verse. It's gonna help us focus on this, this issue that's happening in Hosea between the distance and the proximity of sin and grace. They are far apart, and yet they are also very close and near each other. And what's happening with that? So Isaiah 3.1 says, The Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. They devote themselves to other gods, lowercase gods. Though they do this, the love of the Lord remains. The Lord loves his people, and what do we do with our love, right? We love raisin cakes. Now, if you're thinking about this, I know you're trying to picture what a raisin cake even is. Someone's Googling it right now. I know you are. Um, <clears throat> it's not a different version of carrot cake, okay? It's it just, yeah, you just move the carrots, put raisins in, same thing. It's not leavened bread, okay? 
Um, cakes is referring to a pressing that takes place. Okay? It would be much more like a protein bar, a lar bar. Those are my, my go-tos, right? And what they take to dates, and they squish, and they press these things down until they become this kind of gooey substance in the shape of, of a rectangle. Um, but back then, this is what they, they compress this. They have all these raisins. It's just compressed. And this item is a very luxurious item. It's not the average everyday thing that everyone has, okay? This is not, you know, your, your, your protein bar in the military and everyone just goes and has like a pack of them, okay? This is a very precious and delicate thing. It's rich also and delightful to consume. One commentary compared it to rich chocolate. Anyone like rich chocolate? I don't. Uh, <laughs> So what does this mean, though? The Bible is telling us that it's wrong to love chocolate, wrong to love. They, everyone's looking at it, it's like, no, that's impossible. <laughs> don't you dare take chocolate away from me. I wouldn't phase me at all. I don't care. I just, chocolate's like, eh, it's fine. My wife, on the other hand, she'd go ballistic if the Bible told her she cannot have chocolate anymore. There would be a real amount of confessing and just completion over that. That would be quite hilarious. Um, well, so we're not allowed to have raisin cakes? Is that, is that it? No. Raisin cakes aren't the problem, right? We, we actually see them depicted in other parts of Scripture. Raisin cakes are actually embedded everywhere. But uh, raisin cakes uh, would be used as a nourishment for the weak in 1 Samuel. David actually distributed raisin cakes to the slaves as a blessing, right? Just give, give more blessing. And it was an act of charitability to people. So what's the problem here? What's the problem with sacred raisin cakes? Well, first, raisin cakes, are they really sacred? The second thing is, what are they directly tied to? They're directly tied to the turning to false gods, right? They, their ultimate desire drifts from God and his reign over who they are, and they turn to something common and make it their idol. It's not supposed to be this thing that is worshipped. Right? Their, their love for the raisin cakes had them giving offerings of a reliance towards a false god. It would be much like Edmund in the Chronicles of Narnia, right? Chronicles of Narnia, he devotes himself to the white witch. For what? Turkish delight. We had an uh, event just a little while ago for the preteens, families, anyone that wanted to come. We watched the first film of the Chronicles of Narnia, and then we handed out Turkish delight to everyone. And was interesting, it was about 50% of people that were like, yeah, it's fine. And the other 50% were like, this is disgusting. Like, and so you're kind of wondering, like, why would Edmund like, betray his family, give in, do these awful things for what, this? He's like, more Turkish delight, please. So it's just very kind of confusing. And I think it, we can look at it from the outside and say, how very silly, right? How silly that we would betray God for what? For some raisin cakes? For some chocolate? Why, we, yeah, so you betray God, bow down and worship me. Imagine if the devil did that to Jesus and he offered him like a Hershey's. You could have it. Oh, well, I, all right, I'll, I'll give in. Right? How silly. Um, <clears throat> we're going we're gonna to call things out today. You ever seen this <laughs> sign before? All I need is coffee and Jesus. Really? You really? You sure? You sure about that? My body says yes. That's yeah, true. <laughs> right? Right? But, now, obviously this is very humorous in some sense. I'm making light of something. But I would, I would say it's not so funny to someone who's an alcoholic, is it? Right? Who lives their life and says, in their, in their body, their struggle says, what I really need, I want Jesus, but I also need this other thing. Right? And sometimes we treat coffee and Jesus, that all I need, it's, it's really true to us sometimes. A dependency outside of God that causes us infidelity in our devotion. Something is now sacred and is at the same level as God when it is not. It becomes something that can dictate our behavior. Now, I don't drink coffee, so I realize that as I'm calling people out on their coffee drinking, it's like, that's not exactly fair for me. Because, um, you know, like, I don't experience the issues, right? 
I'll, I'll give you one for, for me. I'm, I'm a movie buff. I love movies. But at some point, when would I use film in such a way in my life where it's like, oh, no, I, I don't want to talk to people. I know God's calling me to do that right now. I know that I should go do this, but I'm going to go do this other thing that I love. And I emphasize just a little too high in my life that I, I can't have this. You know, I, I need this in my life. And I'm, I'm willing to jeopardize and um, kind of neglect other things for the sake of this other thing that I treasure, right? I, coffee is this kind of this, is it just that you heard people say this? They treat you poorly and then they go, I'm sorry, I just haven't had my coffee yet, right? It's not an excuse, is it? Oh, oh, you haven't worshiped this other thing? Oh, okay, I understand, right? Or the, the way that we, wh how would we treat God with coffee? What do we, what do we lose with that? Um, what do we, when we start elevating something, and we think that it's common, we're blind to it. Do we not understand that? We, we're kinda, we sometimes don't realize how bad our addictions or our devotions to other things really are until what? It's kind of too late, until the writing's on the wall, right? And what comes from that is we don't realize that we actually have no vows or no commitment or sense of self-discipline by that point. And you kind of ask yourself, well, where did all that go? I thought I was reigning, you know, control over uh, my desires. I thought I was following God faithfully. But how did this other thing become that important in my life that I couldn't live without it? We're, here's why. Because we're blind to the warnings. So that's what's happening here in the book of Hosea. God is sending warning to his people through Hosea, the prophet. Hosea is a messenger from God. A prophet specifically brings God's word of judgment to his people. Now here, here's the best part about that. It is also in the nature of God's character that the message also is intertwined with a message of deliverance. Okay, The message of deliverance is there because the message of judgment is heeding warning and turning, turn back to God. Turn back to God at this time. So we're going to unpack Hosea's story another time. We're not going to talk about him yet. Who is this guy? Don't worry. Uh, we'll, we'll get around to that at some point. What we first need to do is look and examine at the state of the people and why Hosea is being even sent in the first place. Okay? So we're going to start our study in a more unconventional way. But by the way, who did not see that coming with me? <laughs> Okay, so we're going to start in chapter 9. Oh, wait, 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 chapter 1? Chapter 9. We're going to go right into the middle of the book of Hosea, okay? We're going to just start there. So if you have a Bible with you, uh, open that up now. Um, jump into chapter 9. It'll take me a little while to get there, but let's follow along together, okay? In the time of Hosea's calling, um, he's being called by God to deliver the judgment to Israel, it was about the same time as Isaiah's calling. Isaiah was being called to administer judgment to the southern kingdom, okay, Judah, and then Hosea is being sent to the northern kingdom, Israel. And at this point, God's kingdom has been split in, in two. Things aren't going well, right? But here's what we can gather for the most part. Although that we see division and see the see God's people have like we can see it from like 30,000 30, feet on the ground, everything's going great, according to their eyes. There is so much prosperity happening that moment. The harvest is plentiful, uh, the land is producing, there's great wealth, there's fertility, and there's just this high society success. It is the best of life. Depending on where you've lived in America, around that time period, uh, maybe the 90s, when things were like, man, I just things were great, right? We had all this stuff. That's what's going on with this, this group of people. Life was good from a very societal point, yet Israel accredited all of this, not to God, but to their clever way of worshiping false gods in order to um, I don't know, have like a, like they take their investment and have it really blow up, right? What they're doing is they had a little partnership with a false idol named Baal, okay? 
and they saw their prosperity as a direct result in participating in just a few worship practices towards him. Just a few. We just did a couple things. And by doing these things, then we saw like profit. We saw things double. We saw more prosperity in what we had. I'm going to save you all the nasty details because the junior hires are in the room. And I'm going to be honest, it's going to be incredibly hard in this series. So parents, do your best to have good conversations around the table, okay? Uh, Baal was a god of fertility, okay? I want you to think about that for a second. How do you worship a god of fertility? So they would participate in ritual offerings that would be activities associated with that kind of category. You've been following? Yes? Okay, great. And these impure behaviors were also done publicly and openly. Just, you know, what you see down the street. And that's normal because, oh, that's great. I'm so glad they're doing it because our crops are going to be twice as much now. Oh, this isn't worship to Baal. We're not worshiping Baal. I'm just wearing these socks uh, every day until my baseball team wins, right? I'm not worshiping anything here, right? Right? Um, they just wanted the profits. They just wanted the prosperity and that they believed was a direct result of just doing these few small things, right? Yet, in doing so, they remove all kinds of markings and devotion to Yahweh, to God. And they would claim they haven't. Oh, no, I'm still devoted to God. Absolutely, right? And yet their faith is shallow and it's corrupted and it was disguised as normal behavior. This is just normal. This is just what is done. It's just coffee, right? It's just this thing. It's just another part of our life. It's just the normal American way, right? It's just a thing we do. <laughs> They're living in a time where externally life is rich, Bountiful, and yet spiritually, they are what? Empty. They're empty. Tim Chester puts a new spin on, it's the best of times, it is the worst of times, right? <laughs> he says, it's a time of prosperity that had led to spiritual complacency. A time of complacency that had led to spiritual infidelity. And it was a time that has come to a close. <laughs> So as we start chapter 9 off, the Israelites are in the middle now of a celebration. What celebration? To God! It's the Festival of Booths, which is among the biggest festival of God's people, celebrating. Um, I'll read a piece from it from Deuteronomy. You shall keep the Feast of Booths seven days when you have gathered in and produced from your threshing floor and your wine press. So they're gathering all of what they've produced. And in this particular case... Grapes. You know what grapes are for, right? Mmm, the good stuff, okay? Now you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your sons and your daughter, and your male servant and your female servant, and the Levite and the sojourn and the fatherless and the widow who are all within your towns. This is when everyone's gathering together. Nobody is left out. Oh, this is the big stuff. Seven days, folks. When's the last time you celebrated for seven days, right? Christmas, we try to get done and over with, you know, like get that thing, open all those gifts up. Noon, great, I'm taking a nap. We're all done. It's over, right? Mm. But for seven days you shall keep this feast to the Lord your God at the place that the Lord will choose because the Lord your God will then, guess what? Bless you. The bless you in all your produce and all your work of your hands so that you will be altogether joyful. Now, they do a couple acts here to get a little more better stuff. Don't you think they're also going to do things to get like the blessings and favors from God also? It was the highlight of receiving God's blessing in this festival. This is, the this is when we get the favor. Let's all get the favor together. Whoa, look at everything that we've produced. Let's, let's put it on the threshing floor now. Let's give it to God. We're going to give him a tithe. Oh, it's going to be so good. And then he's going to, in return, bless us. And we're going to receive twice as much. You ever heard this message before in today's world? Sounds very familiar maybe on television, right? Plant your seed, right? Give us a little bit. We'll give you more. You give to God. You're going to get even more from God. Although, yeah, probably true. But should that really be our focus, right? All that they produced of the season, all the grapes are presented to God. And they begin the tithe. And then it's an act of worship and awaiting an anointing of a blessing 
and joy from God. Here we begin. In walks Hosea. In walks Hosea. And there is a place in the festival, by, by the way, that during the festival, God's word is spoken. Okay? So I wouldn't say that Hosea is crashing the party. In fact, he's probably welcomed on stage at that particular point. Oh, speak, speak, right? But he does, I would say, kill the mood, if you will. Okay? Okay, here we go. Because what's the first thing that he says? He says this, rejoice not. Okay? Rejoice not, O Israel. Exalt not like these peoples. It would be like the nations of God. Remember, they're all split up at this point. They're all supposed to be exalting God. You, however, not so much. Okay? For you have played the whore. What is, what, is, what, is, what is the whore at this point? Well, it's first off, it's a specific type. You did it for money. You did it for gain. You did it so that you could get something out of it. You weren't just like, I hate myself, and I don't really love my relationship with God. You were like, I'm directly after something, okay? Because I love the prostitute's wages. And in doing so, you are forsaking your God. You have loved the prostitute's wages on all the threshing floors. What's on the threshing floors at that moment? All their crop. Everything they've worked so hard to produce, they've placed it all there. The threshing floor and wine vat shall not feed them. This will not feed you. You think this is your crop for the year. You think this is going to feed you? It will not. And the new wine shall fail them. So during the course of the, the harvest season, they were participating in impure rituals to assure the harvest was bountiful. They arrive at presenting it to God, receive, hoping to have the blessing, and they didn't rely on God to receive the goods. They did it by their own clever scheming. It's, it's really hard to look in the mirror, isn't it? It's hard to look in the mirror and go, what's wrong with this picture? What's wrong right now happening? As God's people... Do they really see themselves as the cheating spouse? Can they really, do they, can they say that they are? They're, they're oblivious to the harms that it's actually causing to the trust and intimacy of their union with God. They've devalued their intimacy and made it non-exclusive, right? That's the point of having a covenant with God, that there's devotion there, that we're tied together and we're like, yeah, yeah, for this part, but for other parts, I'll seek elsewhere, right? Because someone said, and someone had the great idea among the people to say, hey, this other God can get us more of what we have. Oh, we love more. We love these things that we have. Let's have more of it. And this is how raisin cakes become sacred. Because the more you have, the more you want, right? Now they shall not remain in the land of the Lord. Whose land is it? Whose land is it? It's the Lord's. The Lord's land. Everything they've been producing at that point, who does it belong to? It's coming out of the ground. Whose is it? It's the Lord's. You want the things that the Lord is producing and giving you. You're not going to have it because you're not going to be welcome in my land. But Ephraim, and Ephraim is just another name for the northern kingdom, okay? Ephraim shall return to Egypt. Ugh! I don't want to return to Egypt. Anyone want to return to Egypt? That sounds awful. Why? Why returning to Egypt? What is that about? You're going to be slaves again. In fact, at this point, you practically are. And they shall eat unclean food in Isra. It's under their rule that you will no longer be allowed to give offerings to God. So they shall not pour drink offerings of wine to the Lord. So Hosea is prophesizing. He's telling them about their future. This is what's going to happen. You're going to be removed from this land. You're going to go to this place where you're basically not going to be allowed to worship me. The rulers there will not allow it. Oh, but we want to we provide a wine offering to God. No, you won't be able to do that. They're going to say no right? They're going to cut you off from any expression of relation to God. I love how God uses his enemies to discipline his children, right? 
that even they who are against God have purpose in God's loving discipline. I love that. So whatever they can concur, whatever they would come up with, whatever sacrifices that they could maybe, maybe we'll do things differently, right? Well, we can't do the thing that we're supposed to do. I got a new idea. We're making the best we can do. So God, here's, a, here's some grass or this little thing that I found on the ground. I offer it to you. Well, that's not what the book of Moses says to do. So those sacrifices that you're thinking up that would please me, they do what? They do not please him. It shall be like mourner's bread to them. A mourner's bread is a diseased bread. It's bread that has been touched by death, right? It shall be like death to them. Oh, this is good food. It's good. No, it's death. That's where it's headed. And all who eat it shall be defiled. Now, here's, here's what I do love. Look at this. Notice this happening here. Bread eat the bread. All who eat shall be defiled, for their bread shall do what? It shall be for their hunger only. Ever think about that with our nourishment, the bread that we get, right? Bread will provide only temporary, right? But then what's the next line? It shall not come from the house of the Lord. The bread that you're going to eat is not coming from the house of the Lord. Because the bread that comes from the house of the Lord provides for the eternal. At this point, do you realize you have been eating bread that is eternal bread, right? This richness of this devotion and connection, this intimacy with God. And now your bread, your nourishment will only suffice for the temporary, okay? Suddenly, I think, I think we'll feel it, right? What will you do on the day of the appointed festival? Which festival is this? Oh, this is what we would call the marriage feast, right? It talks about in Scripture. It's judgment day. It's a day that we're presented in front of God's glory. Have you thought about that festival? Have you thought about that day, that appointed festival? For behold, they are going away from destruction. Now, here's what's interesting. Hosea tells them, for behold, you've already, he's like, you already have it in your head. You're thinking, I could get away from this. I'll just go away from all this. All right, I won't go that direction. I'll just run away from destruction. But here, but Egypt shall gather them. <laughs> Memphis shall bury them. They're talking about all their neighboring towns. There's no escape from this destruction. You think now it was just clever of like, maybe I can find a way to make amends with God. No, that's not possible. Okay, maybe I could just run away from God. Nope, that's not possible either. The, the destruction is coming. Here it comes. Nestles uh, shall possess their precious things of silver. You and I think of this and go, okay, great. But for them, I'm sure that's like, oh, don't take that away. Because the, he refers to it as their precious things. So whatever in your head right now, whatever's precious to you, whatever's on the mantle or at home or whatever, that thing or that person, whatever you immediately have in your head and you think precious, that thing will be taken. Life will not be good at this point. Thorns shall be in your tents. I love that description of that because that, that means that the land that they are now experiencing, it's not the land of the Lord. It's this land that works against them. Thorns will be in your tents. That's not where they're supposed to be, right? So consumed by temporary comfort and that left no devotion towards God for their everlasting. Now the days of punishment shall come, the days of uh, recompense, and as a big word, I had to look that one up, um, which means amends for the harm suffered. There was suffering taking place, the suffering. Who was hurt in this uh, relationship? The prostitute wages, the one that got prostitute wages, or you think the husband, maybe? So where's the amends for the husband in all of this? Israel shall know it. Oh, this is the best part. Israel, when this all happens to you, you're going to know why it's happening. And you're going to feel it. And then the very next line is a little confusing, but we're going to try to guide ourselves through it. The prophet is a fool. And if you just opened up your Bible and just decided to read verse uh, 7, 
and, and just been like, ah, I'll just take that out of context. You'd be like, great, prophets are fools, understand. No, the prophet is a fool. The man of the Spirit, and that's an important element, remember that the Holy Spirit is upon the prophets. So the prophet is mad. And the prophet's not mad. This is how the people are viewing the prophet. You think about that for a second. Isaiah's telling them how they're going to respond. I've told you all these things, right? And now you try to work your way with God, work your way out of the situation. What's the last thing that you can do? Denial. Oh, the problem's not us. The problem is this guy talking. This guy telling us that we've done all this bad stuff. That's the person that's crazy, not me. <laughs> For a second, I thought I had to give up my sacred raisin cakes, right? <laughs> okay. So here's what he's saying. He will be treated as a fool. He'll be treated as, I know what's coming. I'm going to be treated as a fool. And the word of God he carries will also be deemed foolish. What foolish nonsense you're talking about. You're a crazy person. You're mad, right? Yet, this is what I love about this. I, I, I know why Hosea is saying this. Because his task is also foolish. The very task that he's saying, he's saying, I know what <laughs> I know what I'm getting myself into here too. I know that you're going to treat me like a crazy person, but I'm still talking. I'm still telling you because I carry a message of warning. I want your ears open. And he's talking about, here's why you're not going to hear, because of your great iniquity and your great hatred. Your great hatred and your great iniquity, the sin that you are carrying right now, will not allow you to hear. It reminds me of John 3, 19, right? which we've, we've talked about before. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Do we understand? Their works were evil. Hosea is not the only prophet, by the way, to be rejected. And this won't be the only time that God's people reject the messenger. In fact, every prophet has been rejected by God's people. It's why Jesus arrives at this point, right? The only one I would say that didn't reject their prophet was Jonah, right? Jonah goes, and oh, the problem is, is that then Jonah rejects the word of God. So he had a whole other problem, right, after that point, okay? But Jesus himself was a prophet. He heeds warning. And it's the religious leaders that who then reject him. This is how the people saw him. They all feared. Fear seized over everybody when Jesus spoke. And they glorified God saying, what a great prophet has risen among us. And God has visited his people. We hear the word of God. Great, change your ways. Mm, I don't know if that's the word of God now. I'm not really sure, right? So they do. They, they, stay, they just can't stop worshiping that idol. Whatever that thing is. Here, the, the prophet is the watchman of Ephraim with my God. So the prophet is this thing here, okay, is a watchman. We're going to get into that word. But what I love about this is the prophet, the prophet is not alone. The prophet is with God. The prophet is with God. He's not doing this by himself. So what's a watchman? In an army, it would be a soldier who's been put on watch, right? He's on guard duty. What's the guard duty for? To watch for the enemy. Now, here's the camp of all the soldiers. Here's the guard. Which way does the guard look? You, you tell me, this way? Or it's out, right? We're going to look outward. We we'll stand at the door. We look out. We watch for our enemy. Why? Because as the enemy approaches and gets closer, they can heed warning. Everybody, get up. There's someone coming, right? What would be the worst crime for a soldier to do on guard duty? What would be the worst crime? What is it? Fall AJ knew. Fall asleep. Why? Because there's no warning. It destroys the whole fleet, right? A prophet has just as much as a tougher task as a soldier. But it's not to look outward, it's to look inward. It's to heed warning from the enemy from within. The, the prophet is a blessing. We hear judgment, and judgment hurts. It 
cuts, and it's because it's truth. But it is also a blessing, right? There's an urgency that the judgment of wrath will come if we do not change, right? And Hosea speaks to the importance of God's judgment, and he's not, like, he doesn't do it as a silent killer, if that makes sense. The judgment doesn't come like, I gotcha, (laughs) you know? The fact that Hosea has arrived is because there's great news. Judgment is great news. The church hates to say that, right? We just love you. We just want to love on you. We just, we just love you the way that you are. No, turn back. Repent. Come to Jesus. There's judgment in those words, and it cuts because there's truth there. When God commissioned Ezekiel as a prophet, he said, You, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Right? I have placed you, I have given you a purpose of urgency so that there is weight to my message. That's what God's saying. The term, the, the idea of a watchman, is also used elsewhere in Scripture. And I'm going to speak to fathers for a second. Fathers, do, do we understand our role? Do you know what your role is? Do you know it? We have been commissioned to a family given by God. And 1 Corinthians holds our job title. And in our job title, guess what the first thing is? To be a watchman. To be watchful, right? And we have to heed warning to the dangers, not just from the outside of what comes and tries to harm our families, but also from what's within, right? Imagine fathers falling asleep at the wheel. What happens? The family suffers. We don't want that. But yet for some reason, we get lazy and we're just not sure. We jeopardize our families from being wholly devoted to God when we fall asleep at being watchful. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, and do all of this in what? Love. We cannot fall asleep on the job. The church is to be a watchman. The preacher is to be a watchman. The deliverer of the good news, you are to be a watchman. We cannot fall asleep on the job because God's treasure is on the line, right? And it's hard. Why? Because no one likes hearing that they're wrong. When you share urgency, that's not right. That's not being devoted to God. Don't tell me what to do. It's our first instinct, self-preservation. Just lock it in. Right? No one likes being confronted with their sin. So being in this role is welcomed with snares and hatred. Right? Being in this role welcomes with snare and hatred from within the camp, from within our families, from within our trusted community. When we speak up and we share, this is not biblically right. This is not following God. There's warning here. Guess what? Get ready. It's going to cut. And someone's getting cut, they're going to flail those arms and get at it, right? You know what's interesting is uh, being a pastor is also told to be a watchman. And I, all I can think of that is, yippee! <laughs> right? And I, it's not the first thing that I think of when people talk about, you should be a pastor. It's like, yeah, because I, I want to go around cutting people with the truth, <laughs> Right? I want to try to guide people and be a watchman and stand firm. No, I think about like, oh, it's going to be great to talk about things, study, be relational with people, right? Build ministries. Oh, that's fun. Oh, watchman, number one title. (laughs) There it is. My job is to heed us, heed warning, excuse me, from false teaching. If I fall asleep at the wheel, we all suffer. And as a watchman in the church body, if you are not mindful of the health of me, of the health of others around here, we will all fall asleep at the wheel and we'll all suffer. Sin doesn't let people hear, 
right? When's the last time you've been confronted with your sin and you're like, that's such a good point. <laughs> right? <laughs> no way. Right? Verse 9. They have deeply corrupted themselves. They have. Not God, not anyone else. They have corrupted themselves. As in the days of Gibeah. Now, Gibeah, you might not be familiar with it. Thank God you probably aren't. Was known for their horrendous crimes of sexual assault. And I'm trying to be very mild. Very mild. Not consenting, not monogamous. Piece that together. Okay? They're being compared to something that they already know is wrong. The, an unfaithfulness that they go, yeah, that's wrong. I shouldn't do that. Yeah, well, you doing these other activities just on the side but still worshiping me, that's wrong too. No, no, no that's way worse, <laughs> right? No, this, right? He, God compares their unfaithfulness to the people's direct actions of debauchery that they are familiar with. And but they thought the whole time, well, we're just better than those people. Or at least we're not like them, right? Imagine trying to, to persuade God with that. And what we've done is nothing compared to what they have. That's what we think. But in the end, unfaithfulness is unfaithfulness. And it harms and it destroys the intimacy that is taking place, the trust that is happening between the monogamy relationship between us and God. And our response to that is, what's the big deal? All right? You can kind of get a sense of what the people are really after, can't you? They don't care about devotion with God. They don't care about intimacy with God. What do they want from God? They want favor. They want blessing. They want something for themselves. They're focused on the things that they can get and take from God, not being in relationship with God. They saw God as something that they could pull from, to make their life better. <laughs> it's convincing someone of how Jesus will make their life better. This, you know, this, this idea that we should go around and just tell people, Jesus will just make your life better. You should add Jesus to whatever you're doing. That negates the whole problem. It negates the whole reason why Jesus has come. There's no judgment there when it's just like, oh, but you could have these additional things for just a little more devotion uh, it's like getting a car and getting an upgrade. It could be heated seats. Heated seats are great. Imagine if we sold Jesus like this. Yeah, you have this life, but imagine if you just had this other thing. It'd be a little bit better. What a great idea. I'll add that to whatever else I'm doing. They won't value Jesus for who he is. They won't see the devotion and intimacy. They won't see the reason to get rid of the other stuff because all we've proven is that Jesus does better your life but they look and say, but so does this other stuff. So why can't I keep doing that? Uh, let's see if Jesus betters my life, but this betters my, my life too. Let's just have it all. There's no, there's no commitment. There's no intimacy in that. We are not in a position of selecting, like handcrafting the perfect life, right? That we gather up all the good stuff. Take this, take this, I'll live here, I'll have that, right? I'll, this good thing, right? This status, all, all this stuff, right? What we need is life. <laughs> you understand? We don't get to build life. We need life. And Jesus offers us life because why? He is life. The life that we actually need is the only life that Jesus offers. Everything else is just a mirage of the real thing. And what stands in the way from us seeing this is what? Iniquity and our sins. And here's the harshness. God will, he will remember, and he will punish. He will. He will. It's common. Heed warning. Now, I'm going to be honest. This has been such a Deb Debbie Downer, hasn't it? <laughs> Everyone like this? Come back next week. <laughs> Just kidding. Where's the hope? Um, how about a perfect verse? You think of verse 10, just, man, it's coming, right? Just a, just a verse about Jesus coming and dying on the cross for us. That's great. So just have it right away, right? Oh, not here, though. Not in chapter 9. Chapter 9, Hosea just lets him sit in it. 
<laughs> okay? And they just have to sit in their filth for a while. The punishment hasn't even come yet. And they're just like, you're crazy. But there they are, sitting in it. No deliverance, no hope. Just remember this warning. It's all going to come true. And then you don't get to get out of these consequences because God adds a verse of, but Jesus loves you. <laughs> now back to your focused life, your self-focus, whatever you got going on, just go back to that, right? Sometimes that's what we do with these little verses. We pluck things out of Isaiah. We pluck things out of the Old Testament. We go, I like this verse, and we hate everything else around it, right? I will spend little time on that and just focus in on this great verse about Jesus, right? Not here. Instead, what happens? Verse 10, like grapes in the wilderness, mm, I have found Israel, like grapes in the wilderness. Now, wilderness is not the Oregonian wilderness, okay? A luxurious waterfalls, berries, whatever. It's a desert. It is desolate, okay? The actual Hebrew word here is mouth. It's consumption. Whatever is in that will be consumed and gone, okay? Grapes don't belong in the wilderness, do they? No, they do not. Grapes in the wilderness will not survive, there's nothing to survive in there. There's nothing to take root, right? Nothing there for them. But here's what's crazy about it. What a precious treasure. In all of the wilderness, God has found us, and we are grapes. Oh, we're pleasing and joyful, wonderful, right? God finds us. I found. Not we found God. God has found you. And he has found you in a place that you cannot survive. Even from the, this is the creation story, by the way, too. You think we were just floating around going, we like it here, but maybe God is better. <laughs> he says, without me finding you, creating you, you got nothing. You would be consumed, crushed, and gone. In fact, that, that experience wouldn't even happen. Wouldn't even be there. What a precious treasure to be found and plucked out of the wilderness, God says, I have found Israel. Now that's our first sign of grace. Our first sign of grace is how God views us as something precious. And like grapes in a harvest, he has given them out. He's taken them. Oh man, it is so good. But without him finding us, we would be nothing. Not able to survive on our own. And Jesus is before all things and he holds all things together. In the creation story, we understand that Jesus is what's holding us all together. This land, that everything that you're getting in your life right now. You might not think of it favor from God, but it is. You realize it's coming from God's creation. These are the good things and we should be thankful and have a heart of gratitude for the thing that we have. Mm. Now, I'm going to go back to this for a second. Earlier we talked about bread. Right? That their bread shall be for their hunger only. What did Jesus famously say? What? What? You cannot live on bread alone. Right? But on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The word of God, Jesus himself. Jesus also said that he was the bread of life. Right? The substance that we actually need. That we carelessly neglect. Right? Our nourishment is what? The word of God. We need to be fed Fed by the word of God, Jesus himself, he's the one that's going to sustain us. And when we are absent from him, we don't realize it, but the things that we're consuming do not sustain us. They don't give us life. And so here's what I'm going to warn you about. It. You might be doing practices in your life, and they're for God, and that's great. But if it's not of God, if we have neglected God from our Christian practices, we are consuming something that will only feed our hunger. It does not sustain us. And we don't realize it sustains us because our sin won't let us hear that it's not sustaining us. Because the temporary, we're being fed, we're fine, what? But we're not thinking eternally. And we're removed from Jesus as being our bread. We're like grapes in the wilderness I found Israel like the first fruit of the fig tree. In its first season, I saw your fathers, but they came to Baal and consecrated themselves on the thing of shame. They consecrated, made themselves set apart for what? 
They don't realize. They did it for Baal, but they don't realize what that really is. It's the thing that we don't, we don't want to be. But now we're idolizing it. We are idolizing our shame. What's fascinating here is the idea of this. Like grapes in the wilderness, that we're grapes. And what's the thing that they love the most? Sacred raisin cakes. They're grapes that have been pressed and are no longer this precious thing. And it no longer has the juice. I want to point that out. I love raisins, but they don't have the juice of grapes, right? Right? It had been pressed in and had been withered up. They are no longer what they ought to be. Actually, verse 16 continues that Ephraim is stricken. Their root is dried up and they shall bear no fruit. We become like the very outcome God is trying to pull us from, and we love it. We love it. We become our shame. We became detestable like the thing that they loved. We loved Baal. Baal's false. We became false also, right? And allows us to have power over us. And shame is, but shame sometimes is better than judgment because shame, although hurtful and painful, it doesn't cut like truth, right? It lets us live in the lies. Shame won't let us see the deliverance that comes from the message of judgment. So we're going to pause there for today. <laughs> Where's the grace, though? And none. Not right now. Not right now. Right now, Isaiah is letting them sit in it. And here's what I say to that. I know there's this piece of you that you're probably going to, someone's going to have a conversation with me, and so I'm going to cut it now. You're going to be like, listen, you're supposed to give grace in every sermon. <laughs> mm, no, I'm supposed to heed warning, right? Right. Because here's why. It's not up to us. In our hearts, we want grace. We know we need it. And in some ways, that's why we demand it. God, you're supposed to give me grace. That's why I keep on sinning, because I know I'm going to keep on getting it, right? No, not right now. Right now, I'm going to let you sit in your filth, and I'm going to let your enemies rule over you so that you can be disciplined, and you're going you're gonna to feel what it's like to be separated from me, so that when that grace does come, oh man, how much more precious, how much more gratitude, how much more thankfulness, right? All right, let's pray. 